All right, welcome everybody. I see everyone kind of filling into the chat. So uh, we are so grateful that you are joining us here today and we're thrilled to be able to share an hour with you this afternoon um, at this incredible conference. Our session today is titled, as you can kind of see in front of you, the growing space economy, the education pipeline and a galaxy of opportunity, which is a really exciting conversation to have. I'm looking forward to this. You can see that today's presenters are me. I'm Jody Guillen, a Space Education Program Manager for Space Foundation. And then we have Maria with us from the San Nun School of International Affairs, a contributing writer to the Space Report, which is an incredible um, report that's put out by Space Foundation. And then we have Courtney Stodd with us as well, the founder and president of Capital Alliance Solutions, the Vice Chairman of the Civil Space Committee and Aerospace Industries Association and a contributing writer to the Space Report as well. So welcome everyone. Um, if you would guys would like to take a minute, kind of introduce yourselves to us today and what led you to a career in space. Sure, so should I begin there? Sure, that'd be great. So I, um... I'm a professor at uh, Georgia Tech in the School of International Affairs, um, and I got into the space field basically because I loved it as a kid and never strayed too far from it. So I did my undergraduate in, in aerospace engineering um, and really loved that and understanding, you know, how space technology gets built, how it gets put together, kind of the, the science behind it. Um, and then I... Uh, sort of tried different jobs and, and worked in worked as an engineer, worked as a systems engineer, and then kind of came across space policy, um, which is really asking these questions about, you know, not just how do we build um, these systems, but which systems should we be building and why are we building them and which other countries or which other partners might we want to work with and how do we do that effectively? And I loved all those kind of big question um, sort of elements that related to space. And so that's how I kind of got over into the uh, international relations and policy world um, of space activity, which is where I do my research now. And a little later on, there's a chart that shows sort of the zigzag of, uh, of my particular career trajectory. But in essence, um, like Muriel, I became very enamored with the whole space world when I was a, a young person. Oh, you want me to do this now, Jody? <laughs> All right, let me very quickly, I won't belabor it. We have a lot more uh, to go through in the next hour, but um, sort of showing the, uh, particularly the young people out there that are trying to figure out um, their prospects. Uh, it's not always as clean a trajectory as uh, Muriel laid out. Uh, as she knows, life has a way of entering one's, one's uh, choices. But when I was a child, I went through the stereotypical dinosaurs and rockets, um, was hugely impacted uh, at my age, which was uh, uh, just entering middle school by John Glenn, who was the first Earth orbiting an American. Um, it had a huge impact. I was very lucky in many years later in um, meeting with him on several projects. And I told him that I'm probably the millionth person to say this, but what a huge impact uh, he had on me and my, my generation. Um, Estes model rockets uh, was a passion uh, growing up. And I have an example of the 1960s, uh, of one of their models. And then uh, can never overstate the impact of um, Stanley Kubrick's uh, Arthur Clarke's Space Odyssey 2001, which came out in uh, the late 60s, uh, had a huge impact on, on my generation in terms of uh, uh, looking to large scale development of, of space, including habitats on, on the moon. Um, so engineering, becoming an inventor. Uh, I was also very impacted by my father's uh, plastics business. I have a little picture of uh, where his former business used to be. And I saw a gentleman who was quite the inventor um, and created really out of whole cloth, a whole uh, manufacturing uh, capability. And it had an impact on me and how an individual can really uh, invent him or herself. And, and that had an impact on me really throughout my life. But I got into high school and um, 
radical change took place. I uh, met a teacher that had a big impact on me and um, I became aware, my, my father particularly was a real bona fide uh, genius and I realized I couldn't compete with him technically. I, I realize that now in my old age, but um, um, I became very, very enamored with uh, the whole uh, policy economics world. Um, and that led to a real interest in uh, the Foreign Service. So I actually went off to the Foreign Service School at Georgetown and um, uh, eventually uh, went over to meet with the Foreign Service people in Vietnam. I have a picture there of the Vietnam era. It was a huge impact again on my baby boomer generation. And uh, the Foreign Service was in the midst of attrition, in the middle of restructuring. It didn't seem to be a great place to go. And then I met this incredible gentleman, Stephen Cheston. Unfortunately, uh, the late Stephen Cheston, but he was going through his own midlife crisis. He was a provost at the university, uh, again, at Georgetown. And he had done a radical change from um, his expertise in Slavic studies to space. And it was through Steve that I met uh, the well-known, again, late Jerry O'Neill of Space Colony fame at Princeton. And that had a huge impact on, on my uh, worldview. And I changed my whole mindset and got involved in uh, space. And I worked with Steve and a few other students. We formed the first interdisciplinary institute for the study of uh, space humanization. At a very young, early 20s age, I was editing a scholarly journal uh, with architects and engineers and sociologists and economists looking at uh, the challenges of, of uh, humanity in space. And one thing led to another. And uh, um, I became aware of a, a nonprofit called the Space Institute. It's now called the Space Society uh, that was founded by Verna von Braun. And I got hired and ultimately uh, ran that for a few years. Um, but eventually just really got involved in the, in the whole intersection of uh, government. You see Uncle Sam in the middle, I took an anorax habitat to represent commercial space in the non-government world. And that was a Venn diagram. Uh, it's basically that intersection of the uh, non-government and government and how in, in my modest way, uh, I could help uh, shape the policy regulatory world. One thing led to another, I ended up in the government and uh, Commerce Department, Department of Transportation, uh, was one of the early directors, of what is today the FAA licensing shop, helped form the Office of Space Commerce and was uh, Senior Director for Commercial Space, White House Space Council and Bush 41 and had several stints at, at NASA, helping to shape um, the commercial regulatory environment for commercial space. And then, as you can see, the listing got involved in a bunch of pathfinding uh, companies. So uh, I will say that um, I've been lucky. I've realized that many of the entities I was involved with didn't exist prior. Um, and that's a wonderful thing about the opportunity working in space. You have a real chance to shape your own destiny in, in, in many ways. So Jody, I'll end there. That's an amazing story of just this crazy path that just kind of leads you forward. And I think that's one of the things that is so powerful to share with students, the next generation of world changers, as I like to call them, because there's a misconception that paths are just straight and that rarely is the case. So I'm going to take just a minute to kind of introduce myself to you a little bit. So again, my name is Jody Guillen, and uh, I uh, grew up in a family. My mom was a first grade teacher. My dad was um, had his own business, and um, you know I grew up in you know Wisconsin and knew I you know kind of this weird path. You can kind of see me with my uh, you know '90s hair there as I'm graduating high school, and then. Many, many, many years later, I ended up getting an opportunity as an educator um, to train in the neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. Um, we look down and I see that beneath us is the mock-up of the space station. And I never, ever, ever thought that I would have an opportunity to do something like that. Um, it was pretty amazing. So this day, I know many of you are probably familiar with this. This was the day that we lost Challenger and I was sitting in sixth grade. And I remember watching this with my um, classmates and my teacher. 
And we honestly didn't realize what was happening right away because we didn't have graphics like they do today. And the way that my teacher handled that moment forever changed my life. And that was the day that I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Now, I would love to be an astronaut. I'm not going to lie. I'm still waiting for my chance. But being an educator is probably one of the greatest joys of my life. Um, prior to working for Space, Space Foundation, um, I taught middle school science and STEM um, to the best students you'll ever meet in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, as I like to call it. And then I landed up here um, in Colorado Springs working for Space Foundation. And it was, it's been an amazing journey, just like Courtney and Marielle shared. None of us probably knew this was where we were going to end up one day, but here we are. Um, it's very amazing. And one of the things that I like to share with students quite a bit is that, you know, you look for those people in your life that are your champions. And those are the people that are going to help you get where you want to go. And one of those people is actually on the call today. Her name is Leslie. Um, she is the senior manager for resource, research and analysis here at Space Foundation. She um, is not feeling well, but I wanted to give her just a shout out for giving this, us all this incredible opportunity to be here today um, to share this conversation with all of you. All right, so now you kind of have heard what our background is and how we landed up here today on this panel. And we really just want to kind of have a conversation about um, you know, what do we think is going to be happening in the next 20 years and how do, how are we going to get there? And I know um, Courtney mentioned early on that one of the things that he was doing was creating or being a part of these organizations that didn't exist until he got there. And I completely agree that it's, it's totally amazing to be part of that process and to see where you end up. Um, I'm curious, Mario, what, do you, what is one of the most fascinating developments you see headed um, in the space ecosystem? Sure. Well, I think the one that we're all kind of seeing play out in the news, uh, at least in part, is the, the growth of commercial um, activity in space. Um, but I actually want to talk about something that's coming along with the commercial piece, since I think we'll probably touch on that, on the commercial stuff a little bit more uh, in the future, and you may have seen that. But as we're getting so many more actors involved in space activity, we're seeing more of a need for something called space traffic management. Um, and this really involves uh, both kind of watching what's up in space. So they call that space situational awareness, uh, monitoring all of the objects. I think there's about 4,000 active satellites on orbit right now, a little more, um, and tens of thousands of pieces of debris. Um, so inactive, there's gonna be inactive satellites, pieces of satellites, pieces of um, rockets, things like that, that are all orbiting the earth right now. Um, and we're putting new stuff up very, very quickly, uh, quickly, more, much more quickly than we ever have in the past. And when you do that, you start to have more and more potential of things running into each other um, accidentally on orbit. Um, and then also, you know, uh, space is used by militaries as well, and it's very important to the military. And so there's the, the potential for accidental uh, collisions in orbit, and there is a potential for um, conflict in orbit as well. And so we have this whole area of, um, like I said, space traffic management, trying to think about how do we coordinate across all these actors, governments, non-government, you know, universities and schools now are putting up satellites. Um, countries across the across the world, and put in place some uh, maybe agreements or guidelines about how we keep space a sustainable space and how we deal with potential collisions and and issues like that. So there's just a huge amount of activity happening uh, in that arena. Um, probably not as much activity yet as we would, I would like to see it go even faster <laughs> because it's just so important. Um, but I think that's one of the, the most fascinating areas to me. I wish I was, as Mary was speaking, I, I was envious of her students. Um, she got quite, quite the enthusiasm, quite the grasp. Just a few numbers that I was looking up um, in anticipation of this. Uh, Today, uh, in 2021, there are roughly about 5,582 so space companies. Um, that's 10 times more than the next country. And the uh, 
UK, in fact, only has 615 only. There are about 10,000 total globally. Uh, so it's growing enormously. The, the launch industry, over 100. Most of them are paper companies. Uh, there's a subset of uh, you know, maybe a, a dozen plus that are, that are real, the Rocket Lab, SpaceX, uh, United Launch Alliance, et cetera. But um, it is quite fantastic how rapidly uh, this, what I'll call this ecosystem is evolving. Um, now I want to put it in perspective. Um, you know, there are 100,000 software companies uh, quickly evolving to about a million in the next five years. But um, to add to what Maria was saying, for much of my life uh, since Space Odyssey, uh, the government, uh, NASA especially, has had a monopsony on space. And um, on the one hand, uh, the government was focused on the Cold War and getting us to the moon, but arguably it, it, squeezed, it squeezed out a lot of entrepreneurial energy. So uh, what I think the great news we witnessed uh, over the last 20 years, and most earnestly the last 10, and certainly most uh, incredibly quickly the last five, um, is the entrepreneurial genius um, that's uh, been erupting, no less. Um, you know, we went from uh, several uh, in-orbit servicing satellite fueling companies to over 45 today. And every day it seems like we read of a new one. How many will succeed? Who knows? Stad's rule is that uh, one third will go out of business. Uh, one third will sort of muddle along um, uh, and deal with inertia, maybe get uh, consolidated elsewhere. And a third will manage like nanoracks, in my humble opinion. I have no equity in them, um, but just observing them independently, will be able to sort of systematically over uh, time uh, get traction. Big question is who's going to make money out of all this? That's still a big question. One more thing to Muriel's point, um, I think for better or for worse, um, you're going to see more and more military um, involvement with space. Um, I think certainly the Chinese uh, efforts uh, are, are going to activate, for better or for worse, um, a Western US particular response. Um, how that is shaped, that space guardian role, will be critical. Uh, I find it hard to believe, looking at history, that they're going to, uh, the Space Force in particular, keep it Earth centric. I imagine that they'll be looking to put their own space guardians, warriors in space. But that whole role of, of the DOD, the defense, is certainly one to keep an eye on. And I think um, it certainly will be part of whatever the dynamic is in, in the coming years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. And I know um, Leslie was just kind of um, dropped a message and was saying that, you know, Indus, India is focusing on private privatization and then in the last year, more than 40 private space companies have been introduced there. And that's something that we're really seeing is this explosion of other countries now wanting to be part of the space ecosystem and the opportunities are just amazing for everyone, I really think. One of the things too that I've really noticed as some of these commercial partners have started launching um, missions, as civilians with Inspiration4 was very exciting to watch, um, is the way that they've been able to market those missions to bring in this whole other audience of people that maybe wouldn't be interested in space at all. So, you know, we've got kids getting excited because they have the zero gravity indicators flying around and um, maybe, you know, people that love cars. So then when Elon launched the Tesla, all of a sudden you have all of these other people that may be, in, you know, interested in what's happening. And I've really thought about that a lot and wondered if that's going to help um, with some of that money making that Courtney's mentioned in the need to kind of develop that ecosystem further to make it more sustainable. I was deferring okay. to uh, Muriel for her comment since you- Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> you deal with the next generation of students, so it'd be interesting to get your, your perspective. Yeah. yeah, my sense is that with all the entrepreneurial activity, students seem to be pretty excited about it. I mean, I think there's one of the changes that, that I think just the last five or 10 years is that the pace of development is so much faster that, you know, 
some of these NASA missions, which are incredible, but they can take a decade or more to put together from, you know, the initial concepts until you're actually launching. Um, and that's tough if you're a new student right out of school to say like, okay, I'm going to work on this for a decade and then maybe I'll get to watch it launch. Whereas now you're seeing companies that are, you know, putting something together relatively small, get it up and launched in less than a year, you know, in a, in a few months. And I think being able to you know, see those results happen so quickly is really um, satisfying and really exciting for students and gives them that, you know, whole lifetime, uh, lifetime of the satellite experience, you know, in a pretty short period of time. So I think definitely there is that, that inspirational element and excitement on the education side. I think, you know, when I think about the, the reaction to some of the commercial activity, I feel like there has been uh, the excitement, and I do definitely see that in the students. But I think there's also been some people who are new to the space world and are like, why are they doing that? <laughs> you know. And so I think there's also a job for those of us that work in the space industry to help explain, you know, what are the implications of that technology that's being developed? Why is it worth spending time and effort, you know, developing uh, bigger and better rockets or more efficient rockets um, when there's lots of other issues we can work on? You know, and I think realizing how many places space technology touches our daily lives and, and enables a lot of the things that we do day to day uh, is another important element that is a little bit more behind the scenes, but um, I think really important as well. I, I think that's really critical. I'm sure many of us in the space community have no shortage of debates <clears throat> with people outside the community who look at it as zero sum. You know, you're, you're investing in this exotic world of, of beyond earth uh, technology and what impact does that have on earth? And of course we know, and Mira is exactly right. We've got to do a much better job of communicating the, um, uh, the, the, the very real tangible impact of these technologies, uh, weather forecasting is obvious, but remote sensing and, and so forth have fundamentally on the environmental um, nature of this, uh, uh, this planet of ours. Um, and I always viewed uh, the future of humanity in space as very much tied to um, the relationship, the beneficial impact uh, on, on Earth. Uh, we can get into that as you see fit, but it is definitely not a zero sum. And final comment about inspiration. I think that was a milestone. Um, and who knows about history, right? It's a guessing game. But I got to believe that was our, in many ways, our Kitty Hawk moment. Sure, it was a billionaire. Sure, it, it, it was a, a you know, select group of people, but what a group of people. Uh, and I think the brilliance of uh, tying that mission um, to St. Jude's, the cancer hospital was, uh, was, was, was really brilliant. Um, and the fact that these were civilians and, and NASA had no, no hit on NASA, but the fact that there was minimal reference to, to the agency, this was a commercial civil effort um, I think was a real uh, game changer that would, I've got to believe, act as a, uh, the John Glenn moment that I had, I suspect has been replicated among many young people out there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. That was absolutely amazing to watch. And I know at Space Foundation, we have a division that focuses on um, you know, space technology and how it relates to Earth. And one of the things we say around here is that we're advocating for innovation, but that is allowing us to better life on Earth. Remember during the pandemic, um, which we're still in, but in those very early days when it was so scary what was going on and watching some of the engineers and scientists at JPL take this technology that they developed for the space station and turn around and use that to create additional ventilators to send out um, to hospitals where they were desperately needed. Um, it, that was a great look at why what we're doing in space really has an impact here on Earth. It's pretty amazing stuff. It does, and, and there's um, another collateral benefit too. Um, again, I have many friends in public affairs at NASA and I don't, and they do great work, but one of the issues that many of us have with the NASA websites is that you're two or three clicks away from oblivion when you're trying to find something of, of utility. You know that the Space Foundation, no less. Uh, again, a great utility, but, but in terms of user uh, friendly, has some challenges. Well, 
there are new groups like supercluster.com made up of some 30 year olds who got frustrated and have created their own very compelling, exciting um, uh, website that puts you a couple of clicks away from knowing everything you wanna know about the dogs and, and other monkeys that have been sent to space to all the cosmonauts, taikonauts and, and American uh, astronauts, uh, Europeans, et cetera, if they've gone to space. Um, and they do it in a very user-friendly way. And they've taken a lot of the stories of space exploration and put it into a very user-friendly narrative form. So um, these are people who were in the marketing PR business and suddenly now are pursuing um, space as their future. And they come along like pilot fish and a big whale. They're necessary, those storytellers, as we begin to open up the frontier. I liked that kind of, I love that, that storytelling of these missions and the people that have been the innovators and the um, adventurers, the pioneers of the space industry. You know, and I kind of was wondering, um, talking along that vein, what do you see as some of the most in-demand space careers as we kind of launch into the next couple of decades going forward? Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that. Um, just working with with college students all the time, you know, I definitely think about this issue. I, I think one of the most exciting aspects is that it really is broadening. And, and I think you can see that. So absolutely, we need the engineers, we need the scientists, like we, there's a lot of cool stuff that needs to be built. Um, but even, you know, we've talked so much about commercial and entrepreneurial, we need the entrepreneurs, right, that there are a number of programs that have started up now looking at space entrepreneurship and, and the interaction of space and business, right, and I think that's a really exciting new skill set, um, you know, relatively new to the, to the space community that's really needed. Um, the, you know, on the policy side, there's uh, a lot of, of issues that for the technology to really thrive, for these companies to really thrive, you've got to have the policy right. You know, you've got to have the right type of regulations that, you know, that's not too much, not too little, the right framework, the right kinds of partnerships. Um, you know, we talk about SpaceX, which has been amazing uh, and, and is doing amazing things with Inspiration4, but um, their original partnership with NASA was critical to their success, right? And so you had some farsighted people at NASA who said, you know, we're going to partner with this commercial um, entity and we're going to, we're going to bet on their success and we're going to contribute to their success. Um, and man, has that paid off, right? I mean, I think it's so, so that, you know, that policy side of it, I think is important. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the storytelling, the communications, you know, I, I think there is just really room, you know, across the, the spectrum for jobs in space. Um, I see someone uh, Leslie mentioned on here the you know data analysis too, which is a great a great point. A lot of my research has had to do with Earth observation satellites, and in that realm, um, you know, there's a lot of new new satellites going into space. But the bigger growth is on the ground in all the analysis, right? Like we have only at the tip of the iceberg in the ways that data can be used, right? And it's going to be combining that with with big data analysis techniques with machine learning, AI, all these other things that are really going to open that up um, and, and create new products and new services uh, that I think is going to be, again, like, you know, a place for jobs and, and a place for new space uh, output. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. I, I would just add that you could take space as a preamble and add it or as a preface to many professions. I, I know that on this particular um, webinar, we have uh, one professor, a gentleman that I knew at NASA, who's using space to uh, track diseases around the world, for example. Um, so he is combining his space uh, expertise background uh, with, uh, with the whole disease vector uh, monitoring uh, environment. I've met uh, archaeologists and anthropologists that are actively using space. So you have quote unquote, traditional classic professions that are now uh, having a marriage with uh, the space, either he or she learning it on their own or they're partnering up with uh, expertise. Um, another random walk uh, is space medicine. Uh, med space medicine was a um, sort of a esoteric field pursued by uh, flight surgeons who, oh, by the way, were interested in, in uh, aerospace. Um, 
I would submit that as the frontier opens up to more and more civilians of all ages, uh, there's going to be subspecialties that will be opening up uh, dealing with uh, uh, the, the effects, both positive and negative, um, uh, dealing with uh, space travel, uh, be it short term or, or long term. Remember, things like radiation and so forth are still major factors uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with, with space. Um, good journalism. Um, with all due respect to the, uh, and there's a, some very fine writers out there, but speaking personally, I find one too many fanboy and fangirls out there. I think we need to have more critical uh, reporting. Um, I was a fan of Craig Cabalt, the, the former writer at Aviation Week, Kathy Sawyer, who was for years a wonderful uh, Washington Post reporter. And these were very balanced and, and I think uh, uh, were very um, critical. They really did their homework and, and dived into uh, the issues. And I think we, we need more of that, not less today um, on that side. And finally, I would say that um, as we enter the space realm, um, you know, we went as a world from the ancient Greek Euclidean world of three dimensions and then fourth dimensions. And now you get into the space dimension, which is wide open. And the effect that's going to have on the human intellect in terms of, of spatial uh, um, uh, dealing with uh, different art forms and so forth, I think is, is opening up a whole new world. And another random walk, um, Arthur Clarke had long ago forecast uh, micro G in terms of uh, hospitals, uh, minimizing that burden on the cardiovascular system. I could see as the costs come down, as Muriel referred to, and we begin to develop more habitats, I can see space hospitals, I can see entertainment in forms that we can even barely imagine today, um, taking advantage of micro G. So all bets are off. Again, I go back, I live in a profit and loss world. So depends in many cases and, and you know, who, who can actually uh, see revenue and make a profit from it. But that's my, my two cents on what I see. Courtney, I have to add, since you mentioned the, you know, putting space in front of any job, I just saw an ad a couple months ago um, for a space barista at, uh, was at Virgin Galactic's uh, Spaceport America. So it really is true. Anything, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> anything you want to do, you can do it for space. That's pretty awesome. I can't even imagine. That would be incredible. Um, I was going to, too, I just wanted to chime in on that 3D printing. One of my favorite quotes um, by the CEO of NanoRax is, we are entering an exciting area in space defined by a new philosophy. Not everything we use in space must be made on Earth, and I think that's really true. Um, and I, that's going to help us get to, you know, get back to the Moon and then go on to Mars. And one of the things um, I always like to tell students is, you know, we I love the movie The Martian. The book was even better. Um, but what would his life have been like on Mars if he had a three D printer? Right? I mean, it would be a completely different situation. You would have been able to troubleshoot and have other resources that weren't actually there. Um, when he got there, which is pretty amazing to think about that as well. Um, pretty exciting stuff. You know, and we're talking about these space careers. One of the things that I've kind of um, noticed as an educator is this issue with getting qualified workforce trained. I know um, we've seen this huge rise in cyber attacks, which is scary to say the least. I know um, the president raised that to the same level as a terrorist threat. It's a very serious problem that we need to get a control of, and I, I, uh, we, you know, we need people, citizens of the United States, to be able to pass that background check in order to get in these high levels to um, make those decisions and have the training to fix that issue. What are some of the other challenges that you can kind of see as we lead into the future in the space industry, both in space and here on Earth as well? Sure, I'm happy to, to start out. So my answer is actually the same as my original answer, but the most fascinating thing I think, you know, is that that space traffic management and how we're gonna deal with this, you know, large amount of traffic in space. Um, but the flip side of that is that if we don't do that quickly enough or well enough, um, we could have some serious problems. 
Um, we've already had one unintentional, major unintentional collision in space between uh, an active satellite and a um, defunct satellite um, that created a whole bunch of debris. Um, we have never had a purposeful attack on a, on a satellite. Nobody has done that, but we have had um, uh, space weapon testing that's created um, debris. And so, you know, we really need to address these questions head on, you know, what is appropriate behavior is in space? What are the steps we're going to take to coordinate with each other and make sure that, you know, accidental uh, collisions don't occur or, um, you know, to even reduce the amount of debris that, that we have uh, in orbit. So I think, to me, those are some of, of the biggest challenges, you know, we pretty much everyone agrees we need to do them. There's a lot, I mean, and that's a, a good start, right? There's a lot of global um, awareness, growing awareness of this of this issue, but still the, the process of working with other nations, working across commercial and government and agreeing on specific rules that you're gonna implement and people are gonna comply with, um, I mean, that's hard. It's hard to get down to the specifics there. So I think that's gonna be one of the biggest challenges. How do we go from this? You know, we all know we need it. We all know it's important, but get those specifics uh, in place and get an agency in the US in charge of it, which is another thing we're still missing. <laughs> I'm glad this session's being recorded because I want everybody to come back and remember what uh, Professor Browitz is saying. This is, it, it, and, and this is my two cents. It's appalling that um, the Congress has not stood up and finally designated once and for all uh, Commerce Department. Uh, I happen to think Commerce would make a good lead. I'm at a point where choose somebody. Uh, the Pentagon has made very clear that they uh, wanna offload that particular uh, sphere of responsibility. Obviously they'll support and coordinate, but it is amazing. Napa, the National Academy of Public Administration, in my humble opinion, wrote a very compelling uh, report uh, supporting uh, in this case, commerce is lead agency, um, but be it FAA, be it commerce, be it fill in the blanks, let's make a decision because there's gonna be, um, unfortunately a conjunction, uh, who knows what the magnitude of it will be. And then there's gonna be a lot of finger pointing and there's no need for that. Um, and we should be proactive. And there's a lot of work going on as Mario knows in the commercial business, uh, AGI among many other companies, Leo Labs that can offer today uh, this very instant uh, capability to help uh, uh, manage uh, this, this uh, growing uh, population up there. By the way, uh, Professor Nekogosian, who is listening to us, is an amazing man. He uh, was a pioneer in space medicine, was a senior NASA government official for many years. He just uh, sent a note in reminding us that from Inspiration4 came ingredients for a new uh, uh, brew of beer. <laughs> so. Who knows what will come from our, our work in space? Yeah, I just saw that it too. It was pretty odd. It's a good reminder. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A that we might want to address here before we move on. Um, there's a heavy load on the environmental aspects. What about the environmental aspects? I mean, think about how the environment becomes even broader once we set out into space. Either of you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, so space touches the environment in, in a lot of different ways, right? So I mentioned I work on Earth observation satellites. So that's one way that that satellite technology is really directly used to understand, you know, the environment and, and what's changing. So a lot of our climate change data, a lot of our every kind of environmental data um, comes from satellites because they're uniquely capable to collect worldwide data over the oceans, over the Arctic. You know, that's that's what satellites can do, and, and other systems can't. Um, but then, you know, there's also, you know, I keep talking about the debris and objects in space and coordination and all that. Um, there's another researcher that, that uh, refers to that as kind of space, the space, space environmentalism, right, or the space environment. And that we have to think about it the same way we think about taking care of the environment on Earth and thinking about long term sustainability. Um, we need to be thinking about the space environment in that same way. Um, so I, I think those are two ways that I think about how uh, space and, and kind of environmentalism or, or taking care of the environment are connected. I, I have nothing to add to that. I think that was very, very well put. Yeah, you knocked it out of the park. Great job. <laughs> um, you know, I wanna kind of segue a little bit into just sharing a couple of, of some of the other challenges 
that um, we're seeing. Um, you know, we've got all this possibility, but then to move us to the next step and go forward, these are some of the challenges that we're facing. So cost of entry, risk associated, um, cost of transportation, any, you know, rate, the framework to put it all together. And then of course, how are we gonna continue to make money and make this a sustainable um, branch of the space ecosystem? Yeah, if, if I may, um, tomorrow, uh, my good friend, Kevin O'Connell is on a panel and I have no doubt that he will talk about uh, $4 trillion worth of uh, space market over the next 30, 40 years. May, may that be correct, who knows? But um, I, I, we, should, we do nobody a favor when we uh, de-emphasize uh, the challenges. Uh, I'm partly based on faith and, and I've spent my life devoted to it. I, I believe that off-planet uh, migration development is part of our DNA as humanity. Um, I see the mining and development of resources, um, extraterrestrial as a huge uh, opportunity, but in the same breath, I can give you the opposite side of it and the, and the tremendous challenges of working um, in a vacuum and, and working in the life and death environment of, of space. Um, and I mentioned radiation and other things. I'm, pretty confident that our ingenuity will figure out a way to mitigate, if not uh, effectively address things like radiation, but uh, they're formidable. Um, so there's nothing that says that we uh, may not end up with Arctic-like uh, depots uh, distributed in the, in the solar system versus the Jeff Bezos, uh, the late Jerry O'Neill concept of these huge space-based uh, human settlements that are self-sustaining. But what is true is that we're developing the tools today and developing the capabilities today. And that's exciting for the students that are coming up and are in uh, Mario's classroom and others across uh, the country, my grandkids that are just beginning their adventures into the school system, um, that they, I think, it is not, it sounds like a cliche and hackney, but I think the, the, that emerging generation uh, very much can um, uh, be the sort of the next paradigm shift in terms of seeing whether in fact we, we, we see the large scale human space development we'd like to see, but there are no one, are, when you look at this list, there are a tremendous number of challenges. Um, and we're really at, at just the beginning of it. I wanna emphasize what Mario said earlier, just grappling with private uh, property rights, <laughs> which have huge implications for uh, private sector investment. We're just at the beginning of that, let alone the, the be governance of, of behavior on an international basis in the earth environment, let alone out in the, in the solar system. Um, what could go on and on? I, I'm working with a company involved in optical communications. I'll remind everybody, uh, the science fiction readers among you and fans of Star Trek and, and Expanse, that all those characters are using optical communications, laser-based communications. And the reason for that, in terms of uh, uh, carrying capacity, terabit level and, and, uh, and efficiency, um, we are just at the very beginning beginning to think through what the Wi-Fi of Earth to Moon and beyond will look like. Without that basic spine infrastructure, everything else is pretty much moot. So we're, so let me add another career, which is uh, space communications, engineering, and um, all the various and sundry disciplines associated with, with true networking in, in, in space. We're just beginning that. I just want to agree with Courtney. I think that's a, it's a really good point that, you know, there's a lot of interesting commercial development, but, um, but there are a lot of challenges. And even the way we use the word commercial sometimes in space is a little different than uh, other areas. And, and, you know, I think I personally go back and forth on, on some of these things like, you know, is it cost effective right now to go and mine materials on the moon? That might not be the most efficient way to do things, but if we don't develop those technologies and we don't have entrepreneurs who are actively looking into the possibilities and, and trying to develop those, then it's never going to get 
there, right? So I think you have to have those those first movers, you know, some uh, input by government, but also these really forward-looking entrepreneurs who are trying to figure out the business case, trying to get that technology move forward. Um, and I see that in so many areas, you know, active debris removal, uh, in situ resource mining, thing, you know, things like mining on the moon. Um, you know, the companies that are trying to develop that stuff are pretty far out uh, ahead of uh, the market in some ways, right? But hopefully the work that they're doing is really setting the stage um, to, to make that possible and make that be able to grow in the future. That's very true. Planetary resources went out of business. They were focused on astronaut, uh, asteroid uh, mining. Uh, they were, that's an example, I think, of what you're, you're referencing. They were way ahead of themselves. Um, and that's part of um, the challenge when you get into this business um, of uh, are you out of phase? I was for example, involved with the early stages of commercial remote sensing, uh, Earth uh, Watch became uh, um, a Digital Globe, which over time was became part of Maxar. Back in the early 90s, we were way ahead of the market, way ahead of the market. Um, and, um, you know, the same thing, I think, is going to apply to any number of these. So you really have to go in particularly on these entrepreneurial ventures with, um, it's not for the faint hearted, you, it's a marathon. Um, and uh, as I like to tell people, uh, particularly the young people, business cycles in the capitalist world have not been uninvented. So the current liquidity and the competitive interest rates that will come to an end. Um, and only the, uh, from a Darwinian standpoint, uh, some uh, will su survive it to live another day and others won't, but that's the nature of the, of the, of the business we're in. Right. And I think if companies like Earthwatch hadn't started to lay the, the foundations and, and try that out, you know, in the early 2000s, I don't know that we would have, you know, Planet and, and some of these other companies today, you know, you, it's a process, right? It is. It's, it, you know, I refer to Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who's famous for his creative destruction or Gale of creative destruction in the, in the capitalist economy that he talked about. And I remind people, you need lots of things happening in order for creative destruction to take place and then have survivors that go on and populate, uh, quote unquote, the new economy. And that's what we're beginning to see today. Um, and I also will remind the listeners that Elon has been around for over 20 years. And, and so is that new space? I don't know. Uh, Virgin's been around for almost that long. Bezos formed Blue Origin way back in the early aughts. Um, it's it's a it's a big business. The uh, a long it it takes a long time, and each one of them has had their own failures. Um, Elon um, sued NASA <laughs> early on in the process, and many of us thought that was it. He was going to lose his biggest customer and partner, and it was Perils of Pauline. Um, People like Lori Garver, the former uh, deputy, was very fearless and, and generated a lot of uh, opponents when she, among others, were supporting, um, partnering with uh, uh, SpaceX, for example. Um, and there are some major contractors, the names will go, uh, that I won't name, that uh, to this day are not happy about, uh, uh, about that situation. So, um, it's, it's, if you're entering into this dynamic, it's an interesting um, and very uh, challenging environment, but with extraordinarily exciting upside. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's those, we need the trailblazers, but we also need people to make it work and hold us back. It's kind of this constant tug of war to move between um, pushing ahead and making sure that we have the infrastructure to be safe while we do that. And yeah. Jody, I don't want to get ahead of you, but at some point before we end, I, I'd like to have us talk a little bit about diversity in, in, in the community and some of the challenges associated with that. But I defer to you when you want to get into that. Well, let's look, let's kind of, we'll look at a couple of statistics. We can dive into that diversity conversation. And, you know, we've got some questions coming in. So I think we, you know, we've got a good, we're trailblazers right here, right now, right? We're blazing trails. Um, I just wanted to kind of reference this. So this is, if you're looking forward and we're talking about, you know, the industry and the growth, you can kind of see where we're headed. 
Um, I know both of you have referenced some of these um, ideas in your, you know, in your conversation earlier. So um, it, there's a lot of growth happening and there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to move forward um, as more and more people start to invest in what's going on in space. It's pretty exciting stuff. is another look at how that space economy is gonna to continue to grow. It's incredible looking at this. It's amazing to see where we're headed. Um, we're looking at workforce development. So, you know, we're pushing the envelope here and seeing more and more people invested into this workforce. And the workforce is opening up, of course, to include all kinds of different jobs that maybe we didn't originally think of. I was just speaking to Lockheed Martin a couple of weeks ago, and they have this whole very robust scholarship program that no longer solely focuses on four-year degrees. They've got training programs that they're doing in-house, and they've got um, you know, associate degree programs. So there's all kinds of ways that people are going to be able to invest in this going forward. And then this last one here, we've talked quite a bit about, this is where one of our challenges really lies here in this country is how are we going to continue to move forward to get people invested in these STEM degrees and in order to fuel that space ecosystem as we go forward. And I really think Courtney, this is a great time for us to dive into that you know, idea of diversity because it's diversity of thought and idea and people that's gonna make this happen. And I taught most of my career in Title I schools, and I firmly believe those are the people that are gonna change the world because they have to think outside the box just to survive. So how do we get that diverse population into the pipeline for the galaxy of opportunity to open up? I'm gonna to defer to the professional educators and then provide a little bit of uh, commentary. So let me hear what Muriel has to say and, and whatever else you, Jody, because you're, you're in the trenches. So I'd be interested to get your perspectives and then I'll add whatever. Sure, well, so I think it's an interesting question. I think I think there is a lot of interest. So I, I think, you know, of course we, we wanna um, entice people, bring people into the, into the field. But my sense is it's not, that's not actually our biggest problem that people are excited about space and, and want to come into the, the field, but I think making sure um, that uh, companies and agencies are recruiting from places that are um, diverse, that they're really, um, yeah, being accessible to, to these students that are already there and excited, I think is a, you know, is a piece of it. Um, so I write in the space report, the section on workforce, and we include um, data to some extent on diversity. And so I can tell you from the data that we have, um, the space community is, I would say, doing not great, right? Like we had, there's there's some diversity. It's gotten a little better over the next last maybe ten years, um, but not a lot better. And I think you know we're sort of on par with um, some of the tech companies. You know, Facebook, Apple, Google. These guys are are having um, kind of similar statistics as what what we see in the space community. Um, and so I'd like to see, you know, every every company has, it seems like every company has a kind of diversity statement and, and all that, but I'd like to see more action, you know, and see those statistics actually, actually change. And let me put out a call to anyone who is here that works for one of these companies or works at one of these companies, um, very few of the space companies release their diversity data. And so we have the high level kind of data on a, on a national level for the US, which is often not you know, it includes the space community, but it's not space specific. Um, and there's only a handful of companies that actually put out their data and will say, you know, here's how we're doing in terms of hiring on diversity, in terms of, you know, the diversity of our workforce. Um, and I think when we don't have those metrics, it's really hard to hold country, hold com companies accountable and to really hold ourselves as a community accountable and, and make sure we're making that progress. Um, so that'd be my personal plea is like, let's please share that data. Um, and, and make sure that we're, you know, being transparent about where we are. And if there's more work to do, let's, let's be aware of that and, and do that work. You know, and I, I just wanted to kind of, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I just wanted to add on with, to that statement. You know, I remember many years ago taking students to, uh, sixth grade students to go visit a university. 
Um, I, at the time, was like, I think they're too young. I don't know if they're ready for this yet. We sat them down before a panel of students. One of the first questions they asked is, what do I do if I get sick? What do I do if I miss my mom? Can I miss class for that? These are the kind of questions that students have that are first generation graduates that they don't know what that's like. And so I think mentorship is really key to you know, ensuring that students of today have a place in that ecosystem going forward because they see someone who looks like them doing that right now um, and passing that down to the next generation of students, I think is a really powerful thing to, to do as well. Yeah, I think that's all been well said. And, and um, you know, I'm reminded when I was involved with the NASA transition way back um, with Scott Pace, who was my deputy at the time, who many of you know was the, the former head of the White House Space Council. Um, and I remember looking at pictures of NASA administrators going back a half a century. And I remember Scott and I looking at one another and saying, let, let me get this straight. They're only white males that can run the agency. They're no women, they're no people of color. Let's get this straight. And I take great pride in the fact that we had recommended uh, Fred Gregory, who was uh, an incredible uh, gentleman of color, uh, great credential. He was an astronaut many times over, commander, pilot, uh, as the first uh, deputy. Um, would have loved to have had him as administrator, but he was the first deputy. We've now had several. Uh, women, including the wonderful Pam Elroy currently. Uh, Kathy Leaders is running uh, human spaceflight, um, and there's several women that are running the centers. Um, but we absolutely need to do a better job of reaching out to um, not only ensuring more women, but uh, people of color and particularly in disadvantaged areas. Um, and this is not a warm and fuzzy political thing. It's the fact that we've got tremendous amount of brain power that we're not tapping into. And, you know, it, you don't have to be a sociologist to know that we self-select depending upon people who look like us, right? So we need to force itself out of our box. I'm happy to see that NASA's STEM program under Mike Kincaid is making a valiant effort to partner up with groups in, you know, outside the uh, quote unquote traditional communities, reaching out historically black colleges, Hispanic uh, institutions, among others. But there's no question when I show up at conferences uh, or virtual ones or pre-COVID, uh, it's predominantly still um, Caucasian, more and more women, thankfully. But my God, it's clear anecdotally that we need to do a much better job. Uh, so AIA wearing my hat, we're trying to do more and more in that area and wearing my other hat with the Washington Business Roundtable um, with our STEM work, uh, we're trying to consciously reach out to these young uh, people in the so-called underserved communities to find that young lady, young man who uh, could be inspired. Um, and um, again, that's a wonderful thing, if I may, on space. I remember once years ago, I was involved with a project, the Zero G, Lockheed, and we sponsored a young lady from Nigeria who won a contest. And she walked like several miles to her school. I mean, it was unbelievable in her, from her village. And we were able to bring her over, do a ZOG. And she went on and it became, by the way, front page across the entire continent of, of Africa. Uh, it was about 20 years ago, I think, roughly. She went on to pharmacology. You know, um, and to me, that's, that's great. I mean, uh, she didn't have to become an astrophysicist. Um, but space opened up um, her thinking, and uh, that, that to me is the wonderful aspects of, of getting young people uh, open up to uh, the potential of, of space and all the disciplines thereof. I just want to reemphasize your point about, you know, being inclusive at all levels, right? Because I think one of the other things we see in the statistics is even when we're getting growth at kind of the, the scientist engineer level of, of the agencies of these companies, you're not necessarily seeing it in the leadership. Uh, the, exactly. The, they're even even worse. And so those people are there, you know, but give them the, the yep. leadership opportunities, put them in, you know, in those positions that allow them to, to really um, be seen and to, and to make change. So I think that's a really good point too. And be the role model for those young people. Uh, Charlie Bolden, of course, uh, was administrator and he was a great role model for, for young people. And 
we need to say a lot more of that. You're exactly right. Represented in the C-suites and and others, uh, even a lot of the new starts, to be honest, could could benefit from from greater diversity. So, back to you, yeah. Jody. I, I actually have a question for you in the Q and A, Courtney. Um, what would it take for Congress to approve space commerce, and as a separate question, possibly its own? Um, NASDAQ tradable marketplace for the moon or Mars. So it's kind of an interesting question there. Well, if I understand the first part, it's what would it take to support commerce? Uh, if indeed that's where they want to go. Um, it would take basically the oversight committee, the Senate Commerce Committee and the appropriators, both the authorizer and, and appropriators, if you give a little bit of sausage making, to stand up and basically say, yay, verily, we, we support. But let me back up. It, it would take the White House to make it a priority. It would take the Secretary of Commerce to recognize that it's important and to take a stand. And um, I think then that would ensure that the both the House Senate committee would, would uh, take notice and make it a priority. Right now, it simply isn't. And NOAA is basically running the office. Um, and it's not clear that it's a priority. NOAA, after all, has a lot of other operational responsibilities. So bottom line, the administration has to stand up, make it a priority, along with everything else that it has on it, in its inbox, but can't underestimate how important it is. Um, as far as the other question uh, going uh, on the exchange, what yeah, can you give me a exactly. little more insight? So um, to, is it possible to have a tradable marketplace for the moon or Mars? I think is kind of where that second question yeah, goes. Yeah, uh, and there's been talk. Uh, there's an economist at Stanford, for example, who's talked about a, an exchange market. There are a few others, uh, other academics mostly, who've talked about it. In theory, sure. Um, but to have an exchange, you need to have uh, enough um, a critical mass of companies making uh, a profit to do it. Uh, if how many ifs to maybe, right? If if uh, mining on the moon, for example, H3, choose your uh, resource uh, of interest uh, comes to fruition and you've got enough to make an exchange profitable, absolutely, but a lot of ifs. Kind of an exciting possibility though to think about. You know, and I just wanted to add too, I think the one thing that we can all kind of do here um, on this panel, but also everyone that's here with us on the chat um, is to do our very best to um, create very educated voters because those voters are gonna be what's gonna move that needle forward as we kind of uh, move forward. I know not everybody is gonna wanna be um, in that STEM pipeline, but they can be by um, using their, the power of their vote and their voice to kind of raise awareness of what's going on. It's hard to believe that we're almost out of time. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed spending this last hour with you. Do you guys have a last thought you want to share with our amazing audience? I, before we I would only, off? first of all, thank you. you. You've been a wonderful moderator and I thank you for it. It's been a real honor to be part of this uh, very, I think very important and timely conversation. Uh, I'd only add to STEM, I th think we three would agree that calling it STEAM is probably worthwhile. There's a whole humanities area that we don't want to disenfranchise that I think we'll have uh, a real uh, career opportunity as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Borowitz. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything you, you've said. I think it's a uh, been a really interesting discussion, an interesting and important topic. I think there is a ton of activity happening in space and a lot of opportunity um, for, for new people wanting to join the field kind of across the, the spectrum. Um, and I also want to say thank you to, to Jody for organizing, for kind of coordinating uh, on short notice and to Leslie uh, for bringing us all together and, and uh, organizing this. So uh, thanks to both of you. Yeah, you guys are very welcome. This has been so fun. It's one of those exciting opportunities that just kind of happens. And Leslie, we just want you to know how much we appreciate you working behind the scenes, answering tons of questions, putting everything together. You know, and I think um, one of our priorities, I think we've all kind of talked about is we really want to make ensure that as we move forward, we create a place that's not just space for us, but space for everybody and everybody has a place in that. So you know, thank you guys for spending this last hour with us. We really enjoyed it. Um, feel free to connect with us through the app. We're, we're all on there. If you have any additional questions that we have not answered, and we'll look forward to 
uh, hopefully get to do this again soon. And sometime. subscribe to the Space Report. Leslie does yes. a brilliant job of editing it. So it's I encourage amazing. everyone to sign up. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really good. Leslie is a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, we look forward to doing this again sometime soon.